Welcome to the Manga and Libraries webinar series. Tonight's topic, Manga and Libraries Defending the Collection. Experts will discuss manga challenges and censorship, tips for collection development, titles worth defending, and more. These webinars are sponsored by the New York City School Librarians Association and the American Library Association's Graphic Novels, Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. You can visit mangaandlibraries.com to watch past webinars and to get information about the upcoming webinars. I'm Jillian Rudis, the school librarian at a 6th through 12th grade public school in New York City and the Japanese Culture and Manga Special Collections Librarian for the New York City Department of Ed. Hi, I'm Amy Dittmeyer. I'm a public librarian in the Chicagoland area. Hi everyone, I'm Betsy Gomez. My pronouns are she, her. I am the coordinator for the Band Books Week Coalition and I also uh, do coalition coordination for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which means I work with our free expression partners. Uh, I'm Claire Nolan. I'm a librarian at a New York City high school uh, and I also worked at a comic store for about 10 years before becoming an educator. Hi, I'm Emily Radica. I am a teacher librarian at a high school in San Bernardino, California. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm a librarian in Canada. I co-host the Book Club for Masochists, a Reader's Advisory podcast. And I also do uh, library and education promotion for Udon Entertainment and the Manga Classics line of comics. Awesome, welcome. So I will ask a series of questions, multiple parts. Feel free to answer whenever, however. Here we go. Um, so if a librarian wants to build a manga collection in their library, how do you justify purchasing manga and why should readers have access to manga? It's popular is, is, <laughs> is really the first thing I think that, that you have to say. It's like, it is, it is so popular right now. Like everyone is talking about the manga boom or the new manga boom within the comic industry and the book publishing industry. And it's selling really well and people are reading it. And everything I hear from, you know, from library folks is that it goes in and out so much. Um, and so like, if you want, if you want to increase your circulation stats, uh, you know, having, having kids come in and like borrow like 20 volumes or 10 volumes or whatever, and then return it that like the next week um, is, is much uh, just, yeah, it just does really increase your circulation stats. Um, I know for my library, um, we're, you know, very inner city and most of my students don't really have access to manga. Um, so, well, at least not access legally. Um, you know, they, they will find stuff online. They're like, oh, you know, this is okay because it's easy to find online. Um, so having legal access to manga is difficult for them. So by providing that in the library, either physically or digitally through our online collection mm -hmm. um, is really important, I think. And I talked to them about that because most of them can't afford, you know, buying manga or, you know, having a subscription to Crunchyroll or whatever. So having it in the library where they come in and they get excited because they see it on the shelves, they like literally like jump up and down in excitement because it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you have this. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden I'm like super cool because I have, you know, the newest whatever on the shelf. And so they're in terms of justification, I haven't had to justify it, but if I ever would, it's like, well, it's a book that students want to read. So of course I'm going to purchase it because it's what students want. So uh, two things jumping off of that one I just I also get that experience where you get a, a kid walks in and they see like a book and they're just like oh my god you have this um, we had a, a, a ninth grader who walked into the library and just got so excited because she saw Demon Slayer um, and became a library regular after that and you know it was the first time she was in the library and that was really I think the hook that got her to stay um, also like if you kind of want maybe a bit more of a you know besides obviously it's popular their students want it um, something I always talk to people about comics is that, you know, comics are a multimodal medium. You have to use textual literacy and you have to use visual literacy. Um, so it actually can often be more, sometimes more complex than reading just a prose book. So if you want to sort of justify it that way, um, thinking about the different ways that students approach manga or, or patrons approach manga, um, some are going to approach it more from the visual angle, some are going to approach it more from the textual angle, but the, the real benefit of reading a comic is that they get both. I think tied into that is that you have teachers teaching with these things. 
Um, and so like, you, it, like if it's being taught in your school or if it's being taught in schools nearby you, you want to have it so that students can access that material. Um, that's one of the reasons I think some of the manga classics lines to promote my, that the titles, um, like the manga Shakespeare title, the manga classic Shakespeare adaptations have every line of dialogue from the original plays in them. Um, so yes. like if you're covering that in your, in your classroom and it's like, here is a visual medium, which is what a play is supposed to be where you can read, um, where you can actually read all of the play as well. So the manga classics, I actually, I have Jane Eyre. I have all the Austins. I have a lot of the manga classics to be honest. And one of the AP teachers is making the students read Jane Eyre, not making them assigning Jane Eyre. And a student walked in and she was telling me how she was really struggling reading Jane Eyre. And I was like, well, do you like manga? And she was like, well, yeah. And I gave her the Jane Eyre, you know, classic of manga. And she was just like, no, I was like, no, it's like, it's Jane Eyre. And she was just like, this exists. <laughs> she was so excited. And she actually went on to check out like all the Austins, the Hamlet, I forget what else she did, but she like read through all of those because she saw like the, the connections and she was still able to have a conversation and, and talk about Jane Eyre in an in-depth way in her AP class, but mm -hmm. going off of manga classics. So um, you're absolutely right. Teachers are using these and we have uh, two new teachers this year and they're so young. <laughs> They're so young and he, one of them is like, I'm gonna teach this in my classroom. I want a class set of, I think it was um, My Hero Academia volume one. And he got a class set and he's teaching it in his classroom as a, as a novel, um, but he's, you know, like 22 maybe. So I think it's maybe an age thing, but definitely, you know, getting more kids interested, getting more, even more adults, you know, the teachers seeing the value of is, is another reason to justify that purchase. So I would just add, um, given the expansion of anime on streaming platforms um, and how much they're investing in anime, um, this is a great way for uh, for students who aren't traditionally like into reading, just to ask them kind of what kind of anime they like on the streaming platforms. There's always a manga tie-in that you can you can show them. And so this is, you know, by having these manga that are tied to animes, it's, it's a really great way to engage students in reading. Or a video game, because there are a number that are, are based on video games as well. Like the Pokemon ones, for example, like those are, can be very popular. Also adding on to that, um, is if patrons or students don't have a lot of time um, for reading for fun, manga can be great. Like I work at a school where uh, we're an early college program. Um, so the students are have very busy with their coursework. They often feel like they don't have time to read. And the comics collection, which includes our manga collection is the highest circulated collection in the library because they have time for that. They can make time for manga. They can make time for comics um, even while they're busy and they don't, they don't get overwhelmed. Um, and so they gravitate to that. So like, that's another great reason is that it's, it's really accessible um, no matter how much time you have. Okay, next question. What are the most common reasons for manga challenges and what are common misconceptions of manga? It's okay if I kick this off. <laughs> So um, manga is challenged for a lot of the same reasons that regular books are, or that prose books are. Um, you know, sexual content, uh, LGBTQ content, which is, is one of the main reasons books are challenged uh, anymore these days. Um, and uh, manga are particularly susceptible because of images. Uh, it's true for all comics. And um, manga have a compounded issue in that there's a lot of misinterpretation of the content because there are um, different values in Japanese culture and American culture, especially as pertains to nudity. Uh, so you had to deal with these misconceptions about the, uh, the, the portrayal of nudity in manga. Um, a lot of Americans automatically equate nudity with sex and pornography, which isn't the case. Um, and so you had to deal with that attitude and also misinterpretations about the ages of the characters because the characters can look very young um, when in fact they are actually adults or um, you know the, the, the chibi style that looks super cute. Um, and it looks like it might be an underage uh, character engaged in sexual activity when in fact it isn't. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, uh, 
Uh, I was just going to say that the most common reason for challenges is that they're too sexy. And also that is the most common misconception, but you just said it a lot better than I did. <laughs> I mean, and that's what it is, is, is they are very sexy. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people, even when the characters are fully clothed, are uncomfortable with that. And um, we've see, seen instances where a manga are challenged, even though the characters are all fully clothed because of sexual innuendo, um uh boys love manga in particular is targeted because it depicts romantic relationships between male characters um and it's really disappointing to see that but it's it's an ongoing issue i think something else is that this is just a, a often a misconception of comics in general is that they think comics people can think that comics are only for kids and especially in japan where that that's not a necessarily a popular cultural norm. Um, there's much more just like, you know, types of manga um, for different age groups. Um, and people often get it in their head, oh, comics, kids. Um, therefore, when they see something that isn't for kids, but is appropriate for teenagers or for adults, they, they tend to really freak out, especially because as Betsy said, um, people react really strongly to images in a way they don't necessarily react to prose. Yeah, it's, it's not a manga example, but just uh, very recently, um, for Free Comic Book Day, a, a library in, I think it was Long Island, uh, gave out a title a, from Silver Sprocket Comics um, that was mature rated, and they didn't look at the age rating on the comic, apparently, and they gave it out to kids, and the parents got upset, and then the library has said they're never doing Free Comic Book Day again, unfortunately. So it's not just, it's not just Japanese comics that people get upset about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one thing to to kind of add on to that is uh, the fact that it's so easy to isolate an image in a comic and in manga and target that specific image is a reason it should be censored or removed from a library or a school. Um, when in fact people should be considering the work as a whole, it can be very difficult to get past that obsession with that single image though, uh, when it comes to talking to parents who are upset. And, um, you know, a parent has a right to make decisions for their own child, but they can't make the decision for every other child in the community. And so it gets difficult. It's a hard conversation to have. And I, wanna, I wanted to add too that I've never had a child be upset about an image in a comic. I've never had a student come to me and say, oh my gosh, this is inappropriate. Um, it's only adults I've ever had uh, issues with, teachers in school. Um, I had a particular teacher who came to me with, with a book, a student had checked out and they were like, have you read this? I was like, well, I, I don't think I've read volume six of whatever. And he pulled open to one page that, that had some, not nudity, but very carefully placed items. And um, he was so upset. He was like, I saw this over my student's shoulder. He was reading this in my class. And I was like, okay, well, he was reading in your class. Like, aren't you happy about that? But he was so upset by this one, one image on this one page. And so we, we kind of had a conversation about it. Um, and I you know, explained some things and, and this one particular teacher was still pretty upset. Fortunately, he's retired, but, um, and I left it on the shelf. But yeah, I, I've never had a student come to me and be like, oh, this is so offensive. How dare this be in a book that you're checking out? But parents, teachers, of course, it seems like they're more worried for their student than the student is. Yeah, there was an example late last year at um, Kent State University that was doing, it wasn't manga, but it was a book about anime. Um, and it was being used as a textbook in this class. And uh, apparently there was one image of a hentai, uh, like pornographic animated film um, in the entire book uh, that the parents parents of this student got very upset about. Um, and a, a US representative, a state representative said that the book went way beyond pornography. Um, and I looked, I went and I was like, I, I was like, I want to see what people are so upset about. And I went and I looked and it took me forever to find the one image in the book. Cause it's mostly a textbook. It's just like an ac academic book about anime. And then there's like a section with some images and I'm like, oh yeah, there is one image in this entire book. Clearly you need to pull the entire thing from this academic course. And uh, that is sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the book was Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle by Susan Napier. Um, and she's an expert in anime and has actually been an expert uh, witness in some of the um, cases the CBLDF has managed. Uh, and the, fortunately, the school stood by the course. It was a um, freshman comp course that high school students were allowed to take with parental permission. And uh, the school stood by the, uh, the professor and defended the work. 
think the, the interesting thing about this whole thing is people will be uh, upset about the content of manga. They'll be like, the violence, the profanity, the sexuality. But then in the same conversation, they'll be like, manga is for children and there's no literary merit. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what's happening here. But I think the biggest challenge that we face as school librarians, I don't know if it's the same for the public library, is making sure that the manga is age appropriate, right? It's, we have the right manga for the, for the audience that we're working with. And I think that will just avoid all of the, the challenges, but Amy. Hi. Oh, hi. Sorry, okay. All right, next question. Have you ever dealt with or know of a manga challenge? If so, what was the challenge and what was the process? So, okay, if I kick this one off to you. Yes, of course. <laughs> I know of several instances, oh actually. Um... So sorry. <laughs> My security guard just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> like, it's all happening. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just I'll just pick up. That's okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I know of several instances uh, where manga have been challenged. I was actually um, taking a look at ALA's list of titles that were challenged in 2020, and there were two manga on there: Naruto and Seven Deadly Sins. Um, they didn't have any information on why they were challenged, but I suspect it was sexual content because or or violence. That's another common reason that manga are are um, are, are challenged. Um, and neither of those series are are what anybody would consider sexy series, but there is innuendo and uh, misbehavior. Um, and uh, kind of another example, um, a recent example, uh, Banned Books Week uh, tends to be an excuse for some people to just like come out of the woodwork and challenge books. And uh, a year or two back, uh, there was a uh, LGBTQ um, banned books display in a library in Maine. And my lesbian experience with loneliness was one of the titles on that display. And some local Baptist ministers got very upset and tried to uh, have the books removed. Uh, I think in that case, also like the library stood by the display because LGBTQ content in, um, was uh, the predominant material challenged in that year. And so they focused on that as part of their display. And that's just a couple of recent examples. We've had instances, uh, in Texas, where they tried to remove all of the manga from our, uh, a library. Um, there's been instances where Dragon Ball Z was removed, I think also in Texas. I need to check on that actually, um, because it has incidental nudity, uh, usually for comedic effect, <laughs> especially in the early volumes. So yeah, it's, it's, it's happened um, on more than a few occasions. I, I personally haven't had a challenge in my library. Uh, the, the challenge I face is that teachers don't think manga is you know, real reading, but obviously that's like a different challenge. But I know that there was a school in New York City, I think it was on Staten Island, and Assassination Classroom was actually pulled off of the shelves. And this was pulled off the shelf by um, a parent and the school just like pulled it and they didn't even go through like any sort of challenge process. And in New York City, in the Department of Ed, the Office of Library Services has created a whole protocol for handling challenges in the library. And it was just like one upset parent made a decision for the whole school community and had that off. Now, if you're familiar with Assassination Classroom and you learn about that story out of context, it can definitely be concerning because you're seeing guns in the classroom. And with everything that goes on in America with violence in the classrooms, I could see that being concerning. But if you actually know the story, it's obviously that's not what the story is about, right? So I think it's upsetting to see that one idea, a series that wasn't read by somebody, just gets completely pulled off the shelves because they didn't like take into account what the whole story was about. But the process usually requires a reviewing committee. So it could be usually not people in the school, it has to be people from outside of the school. So other educators, administrators, somebody from the Office of Library Services, the librarian, everybody is required to read the book that's being challenged and then have a conversation about the book and some of their concerns. And then the reviewing committee comes to a decision to decide, is there educational value here or not? And then they'll pull it or keep it. 
but this was just like taken off and then that's what caused the problem. I don't know if the CBLDF got involved, but I know you have a whole article about it. Betsy, are you familiar with this? Yeah, I think uh, at the point in time we found out about it, we weren't able to do anything, which is the unfortunate thing is uh, um, there, there have been several instances where um, the the administrators didn't follow their own policies and we're actually seeing that right now with the situation in leander texas where they're reevaluating their reading list there wasn't a formal challenge filed but they based on a complaint during a school board meeting started an entire process of reviewing reviewing their independent reading lists and comics were disproportionately impacted um, as far as the removals go um, i don't think any manga titles specifically were on those lists but the the, the fact is, is comics were an easy target in that particular situation and the school didn't follow its own policies. Uh, and so, um, you know, censorship generally happens when, when we don't find out about it. Um, and so it's, it's on us to be very vigilant um, and pay attention to, to our policies when we're working in libraries and schools. Uh, CBLDF is always here to help, of course. Um, and, you know, if you, even if you're not sure something's happening, but you suspect something might be happening, it's not a bad idea to reach out and talk to people about it. Um, because the best way to stop censorship is to shine a light on attempts to make it happen. I was just going to quickly share the one challenge that I had to um, a manga was by a parent and um, she came into the library very upset that her student was reading. I believe it was Attack on Titan, um, if I remember correctly. And she was very upset, you know, stormed in. And my strategy, we also have a process for challenging books, not just manga, but just for, you know, everybody has to read it and it goes to the principal and then it goes to the board and blah, blah, blah. But um, so after I'd spoken to her and kind of realized that she wasn't going to back down and be okay with it, I just started kind of piling on the paperwork. Um, I was like, okay, well, the first step is, and I gave her like my collection policy. I'm like, well, why don't you read this and let's review this. And then, oh, well, here's the paperwork that you have to fill out if you want to file a formal challenge. And then we have to do this. And then you have to come to this meeting. And then we have to have another meeting. And after that, she was just like, yeah, you know what, never mind. Like it was, it was too overwhelming for her. So like the process kind of deterred the challenge and she just eventually was like, well, I don't like it. And it's like, okay, well, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll make sure that your student doesn't check out these books. Um, but it, that, I don't know if that will work all the time, but it definitely worked because I think she just wanted to, to, to be heard, you know, to have that voice. And then when she realized the work that would go into officially challenging it, she just walked away. So, you know, that's, it's a strategy. I know it absolutely is. And, and that's why uh, we generally endorse having a policy that involves paperwork because people tend to, you know, back away from it when they realize they're actually going to have to work for this censorship. Yeah, I had a work. very... I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I was laughing at Emily's story because almost the same exact thing happened to me <laughs> where... Uh, it never got to a formal challenge phase because the parent, and I believe the title their child checked out was like a Sailor Moon uh, volume, but um, in the past she had been very vocal about, she didn't want her children checking out like Panic at the Disco, like anything too, woo, um, and always having a really good collection development policy on hand that's I think that's key and also your um, for us we had like a formal uh, like um, request for removal policy at our library um, having that at the ready and not seeming like you're delaying to like kind of offset their anger always really helps I think uh, active listening is also key to a lot of these situations and, and like listening to their concerns and making sure that they know you're listening, um, even if you're going to stand by the material because it is acceptable for uh, under collection policies. Sometimes people just need to, to get their thoughts out there and just need to talk to somebody about their concerns. I had that with a parent who she was concerned. It actually was it wasn't manga, it was another comic and it was in a class I was teaching on comic studies. Um, who she was concerned about one of the texts we were reading. Again, is the kind of thing where she saw one page out of context over her daughter's shoulder. Um, and she came in during parent, 
parent teacher conferences and to talk with me and we talked about other books that are in our school's curriculum. Uh, this was also as a class in the college program. It wasn't in the high school program um, that had sort of similar content, but was prose and that she was familiar with like Handmaid's Tale or the Iliad um, and sort of contextualizing that helped her understand it. This was like, I was very glad she didn't challenge or push, but we, we kind of talked about like thinking about how the work, the comic or the comic or manga or visual medium compares to prose that they're already familiar with and know like what it is and kind of can understand the context around that. Or even comparing it to other media like movies or TV shows or things like that. I was just going to say before about paperwork, I just think the idea of having your own paperwork available. So if it's a collection development policy or a challenge material policy, um, making people fill out paperwork, making people have to read, making people have to go to meetings and be a part of decision making, right? Giving them like all these steps, like because showing them that this is not just, oh, you don't like it. We're going to just pull it because you say so. And also, I think a lot of people, I know teachers in my school just don't understand manga. So they're afraid of manga and just, they just need a little bit of an, a little bit of an education about manga can also go a long way. Tie this briefly back into your, your first question about how to justify purchasing manga, put mm -hmm. it in your collection development policy so mm -hmm. that you can say, hey, we're supposed to buy this stuff specifically. It says here in our collection development policy. Yeah, so we're going to have a resource doc for this webinar. So if any of the panelists have uh, a sample of a collection development policy or a challenge material policy that they want to add to the resource doc, and then people can look at that for models if they don't have their own, that would be awesome. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, ALA has a lot of great resources for developing collection uh, policies and challenge policies. And um, ALA and CBLDF and the National Coalition Against Censorship in particular are are definitely there to help if people need advice. I'm actually working on revising my collection policy because I didn't include it before and I, I have, I'm working on it and revising it. And uh, one thing that I'm making sure to include is on the Common Core state standards. Um, there is a specific place that I know that they're not universally adopted, but they're adopted in, in many places. Um, but there is a specific standard that mentions graphic novels, comic books, um, within the standard itself. So the language is actually within the standards. So that's part of, that's gonna be a main part of my collection policy to say, oh, well, it's not, it's not me, it's the state standards. See, I'm making sure that my collection development policy is in alignment with the national standards. So using that, it's, I always try and, you know, pass the buck on blame, like, oh, it's not me. It's look at these people making decisions that I'm trying to adjust my collection to. So using that as a, like a, a, a foundation for my policy is gonna be, I think really helpful for any future challenges. All right. Censorship versus collection development. I struggle with this sometimes, right? As I'm building my collection, I'm like, oh, if I've had weird feelings about a certain manga, by not buying it, am I censoring? And then I'm like, no, Jillian, you can't buy everything. You just have to buy whatever you can afford, whatever you can fit, and you have to make the best choices. And this just maybe isn't the best choice, but I would like to have a conversation about really understanding the difference between what censorship really is and what that looks like versus collection development. So what is the difference between censorship and collection development? Do you have a collection development policy? We already said that some of us do. What are some things you include or some tips for what people should include? Okay, so I'm going to come at this from a different perspective as well. So I, and I'm don't get mad at me, but I'm not a manga reader. I don't enjoy manga. Sorry. Um, I love comic books. I will debate with you like the difference between Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel and why they're both awesome all day long, but I just don't enjoy manga. Um, I don't know if it's the big eyes or what it is. I just don't, I don't enjoy it, but I am always like, I'm always here for it because I see the impact it has on students. So I kind of approach all manga titles with like, ignorance a little bit like I go in thinking okay here's this title I don't know anything about it I'm not going to spend my time reading it but I'm going to look at the publisher ratings I'm going to talk to students about it I'm going to look at the anime if it's based on an anime I'm going to do all the normal research I would for a, a regular textbook um, before I purchase it 
And even then I'm only gonna purchase the first few so that I can kind of browse through and make sure that it works and then put it on the shelf, see if students like it, and then I'll buy more. I'm not gonna buy you know, 40 of them right off the bat. So I think maybe I avoid the censorship issue because I'm not putting any of my personal bias on it. It's like, okay, I know nothing about this. What do I do with like a, a normal book? That's the same process I have for, for purchasing manga. Emily, you need to uh, pick up the Marvel Meow comic coming out this fall. That's about Captain Marvel's cat. Um, it's 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 Viz is <laughs> that publishing amazing. it. amazing. Yeah, it's being published. It's a it's a manga. It's published by Viz. Um, okay. So that that might I'll be more that might it's be your, more hard. Up Reading manga is hard. I'm sorry, and like coming from somebody, I didn't grow up with comics. I wasn't allowed to read them as a child, and so reading, I sat down to try and read the first volume of I forget what, and I was like what is happening? There's like four different things happening on this page. It's jumping around. I'm so confused. So when I, when students read manga, I'm so impressed. I'm like, guys, you are doing so much. You're inferring, you're, you're, you're figuring out your own timeline. You're learning so much about these characters. You're amazing. So manga is incredible. I'm just not, I'm just not good enough. There are, there are definitely very different storytelling techniques that are used in, in manga that are not common in, in other places and once you've started reading them more you start to learn oh that's what this means that's what like this expression means that's what that this um like symbol means or whatever it is and it's, it's interesting to learn those as you read more um as for censorship versus collection development um censorship is like the comics that they literally will not ship to canada because the government will seize them at the border <laughs> um that that's that's censorship when the government is doing it in japan they cannot publish like they cannot print genitalia in their comics, um, and it's always censored in the stuff that that's that's being done because the government, like the government, will not let them do it. It's like the law. Uh, there was a, a, a manga that came out a few years ago called um, "What Is Obscenity: The Story of a Good for Nothing Artist and Her Pussy" by Megumi Igarashi about a, an artist who was actually put in jail um, for for making art um, about that about that, and like that's censorship not buying something for your library isn't censorship <laughs> um and then the the another aspect that i think is maybe not so known as much is the the kind of self-censorship in some ways that publishers are already doing um to prevent people trying to get them pulled out of stores or out of libraries and things like that you get people being crucified um, in com in manga sometimes and suddenly they're not crucified they're just on a big block of stone um, or a um, a symbol that looks like uh, like that's a swastika will get edited out um, because it has a different meaning in Buddhism than it does in that when you see that symbol in, in America um, and so those things are like the publishers are already know things that might get challenged and and, and try to avoid dealing with the, like try to ensure that those don't happen sometimes like you mentioned assassination classroom a while ago and that was a title that i think people didn't even expect to come out necessarily in english uh because of the content and i guess eventually they were like actually you know what this isn't that bad um the other title in that is saint young men by hikaru nakamura which is about jesus and buddha uh living as roommates in tokyo in modern day tokyo and just hanging out and it's a comedy series and people were like oh i don't know if that and the, the creator didn't want that released in english because they thought it would be too controversial we've, we've gotten off track a little well i you know i think uh, uh matthew and emily you're both making uh, very good points in different ways. Um, you know, when a publisher decides to make changes, that falls into the umbrella of editorial decisions. Um, and they're making that decision ostensibly to make sure that they can sell the book, um, that it's acceptable. Um, and, and in intellectual freedom circles, we, oh, we often talk about something called community values. And what it is, is understanding the values of your community, understanding what your community finds important, the type of topics they prefer to read about, the type of things they, they like to read. Um, and Emily, you may not like manga personally, but you recognize that your community does. And so when we're in this role of developing a collection, we can't have everything. It's impossible to have everything. Um, but what we can do with the resources we have is decide what is most beneficial to our community, what's going to have the best circulation, what's going to benefit our, our readers the best, um, what they're going to want to seek out. And that's what we need to understand when we're, when we're doing collection development. And 
you know, deciding to not purchase a book or deciding that a book that isn't circulating needs to be removed so you can make space for something that will circulate, that is what a librarian does. It's not censorship. Unless you're letting your personal values determine that, then it, it kind of does fall under that uh, umbrella just a little bit because you're not thinking about your community, you're thinking about what you like. And what we need to think about is what benefits the community. Building off of building off of that, um, I think one thing I just do in general with collection development um, is I think about my students and who they are. And a question I find myself asking a lot is whose voices are missing um, when I'm doing collection development. And, and you know, it's the kind of thing with manga where, you know, maybe the shonen manga, maybe Naruto and, and Dragon Ball and, um, you know, Bleach are maybe my most popular titles. But I also have students I know who like could really benefit from reading manga who maybe that's not their speed. So I want to find other types of manga that maybe even aren't types of manga that I particularly enjoy. Um, but like that they would join maybe some more like romance stuff or at least sometimes I've got some students who really like horror. Um, and sort of seeking out like what what is my community asking for what is most appropriate for them. Um, especially when you're dealing with teenagers um, and what's missing what's missing here that I could include that I'm that I maybe have a blind spot for that's um that's always a question that I think everybody asks themselves as librarians so making sure that we're representing our community but also I one thing I really love about manga is the diversity maybe not in like terms of racial diversity but the different types like we talked about the the manga classics there's um there's some really great nonfiction manga out there that I found and I was so excited to like put on the shelves um and it's like micro computers manga and like it's a whole bunch of nonfiction titles so finding things that I think students will be surprised about and introducing them to that it's exciting it's like yeah you're going to tell me a lot because you guys know more than I do but have you checked out you know this title that maybe you didn't know about um so being part of that is it's kind of exciting because the students know more than I do for sure but I can also introduce them to so much that pushes them but because it's manga they're going to pick it up because they already know they like the 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 format so using that as like a not a gateway because i don't think of comics as a gateway comics are just good themselves they don't need to be moved on from they should just be what they are um <laughs> but um just as like a, a different way like hey you like this maybe you'll like this too i know one of the challenges for me that's uh, always occurred in collection development is that um, our budgets are, don't have discrete lines always. So when I was doing all the purchasing for YA at my previous position, um, I had YA fiction and that was it. And it wasn't a lot <laughs> per week. Um, so then it became, well, I'm sending this much aside for fiction uh, prose this month and then uh, American comics and then manga. And then in that manga section, here's everything that the teens requested and that I've already researched and reviewed. Here are series that I would like to continue purchasing. And then here's some things I wanna take um, some new chances on, uh, which is how I found out about like some great publishers like Seven Seas that have some different titles, um, especially with better representation that the kids were really needing in some of their reading material and wanting. But it gets really hard. I'm really lucky that a lot of the libraries in this area are part of a large consortium of like 100 libraries. So we all share with each other, we share resources. So if I can't catch up to where uh, my hero is right now, I know other libraries in the system will have it and will gladly send it to me. And that turnaround time is two to five days, which I know for teens can be really, really hard because they're like, I want to leave with 10 volumes right now. Um, but as long as I have some other things to put in their hands, it's usually okay, usually. Um, and then when I was doing adult manga too, it got, it was just as difficult, but I at least had more money to play around with. Um, and um, luckily, um, it was just a lot easier. Um, and I think that was just because, yeah, more, more money afforded to adult fiction. 
this has come up a couple times, but I just kind of want to emphasize it. It is totally okay if you've got like a 20 volume series to just start with like one or two volumes and test that out and like see how it goes and how it works with students. And like, I know in, in my library, I try to like, if there's like a really long series, I will usually only get like maybe up to the first 10. And after that, I could be like, I guys, I don't have enough space. Um, but the public library exists and has all 60 volumes that you're looking for. And I help them connect um, that way. But I think it's just because I think people sometimes get overwhelmed by how long um, different series of manga can be. And it's, it's okay to just start small. And it's okay also to find some manga that isn't 60 volumes and collect those as well. Like um, all the manga don't. classics books that are only <laughs> yeah, one volume long each. I was actually just going to say something similar, Claire. I, um, whenever I buy a new series, I and I know it's going to be popular. I always try and buy like two or three of the first couple because the ones, at, as you know, they don't always get back to us. And so, especially volume one disappears, and then nobody can read it because volume one is gone. So I try and buy at least two, sometimes three copies of a volume one, two, three, um, just because you know books don't come back; they walk away. Um, but also the the problem with space, I actually have a whole manga section. It's actually, this is my library part of it. And that, right, that shelf right there is all manga. Um, and, but space is still limited because they, you know, these big series. So what I started doing is um, my district started giving us funds for our digital collection with the distance learning. So I have my school funding and then I have my district funding um, and that all goes to our digital collection. So if I know that there is a super long series, that's really popular, but I just don't have space for it. I say, okay, I only have one through 10 on the shelf, but then I have 10 through 30 online. So you can only check out the physical copy for one through 10, but go check out, you know, our, our online source or our online collection, because you can read the rest there. So it's just a way to like save space and get kids interested, but then kind of push them onto the online for, you know, space saver. Yeah, New York City, oh, sorry. Just uh, New York City is really lucky at, you know, as Jillian knows we, that we have the city online library, which has tons of books that I can't necessarily have in my library, but that I can easily like send kids to as well, which is fantastic. Matthew. Oh, I was just about to suggest, I was, I was going to suggest that the having digital things for, for longer running series as well. Um, especially because honestly, like the circulation is going to be highest in the first few volumes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's going to decrease as, as, as the series goes on often. Um, so having those available digitally is, is a good answer for that for both shelf space. The one thing I will do to suggest is have something in your library that tells people that you have these digitally. Um, you know, whether that's like a, um, like a sign on your shelf or like a flyer or whatever saying, Hey, you've read this volume up to this point and you want more go to our website. Here's how you can download this and read the rest of it. Just because people won't, people won't necessarily look and not everybody will talk to you and ask you about this. And so having like passive um, material around to tell them where to go is really useful for that. You know, I helped to build the New York City digital collection for manga and we have over a thousand titles in there. And Matthew, I never once thought of advertised. Oh my gosh. Just like, it's like I curate that collection. Uh, I need I need to create now a poster and put it up in September. Like, hey, we got so much more online. Or is volume one missing? Because volume one is like that pair of socks that like like just socks always disappear in the laundry. And so does volume one of manga. So it's like okay, you can't read the rest of the series because volume one is gone. But check the digital collection. But last thing I wanted to say about censorship versus collection development. I struggle because my school is six through twelve. So I have 11 year olds and 18 year olds or 19 year olds sharing the same exact collection. So I just have to be so mindful when I'm picking manga. And sometimes I'm like, what, what is helping me be mind, mindful? Is it my biases? Like what, what is it that's like, and, and I freak out. I'm nervous usually about everything, but I get nervous that I'm making poor choices based off of, because I look for things like, is this too violent? Is this too sexual? Is this like, you know, how do I know it's appropriate, really, like for kids in my community? I mean, I know what their maturity is. I know what they're like, but their lives are very different than how I grew up. So I don't want to make assumptions about them either, but I can go off on a tangent. But I just worry because I have such little kids in that collection, too. So my friend, she's just in a high school library. She can really get whatever because she knows that she's got older teens. I got to check for that 
all ages, you know, teen, older teen. If it says mature, that's probably not going to happen, right? I just can't. But. Well, this this leads directly to your next question. Yes, that's right. Thanks, Matthew. Do you use publisher ratings uh, to help with collection development? And how do you decide what is appropriate for your intended audience? Okay, I, I, I want to tell a story first here that I think is very funny that I just saw this today online and someone was asking about a specific title and if it was appropriate for their teen collection. Um, and it was Nana from Viz. And they're like, it's part of their shoujo beat line. Does that mean it's like teen appropriate? Because shoujo is usually thought to mean like kind of teenage girl comics. And there is a lot of, there, there are some quite spicy stuff in the shoujo beat line of, of comics. Um, one that came out recently is uh, Yakuza Boyfriend um, that is rated mature. Um, it, if I remember correctly, and there's like a lot of sex in it. And so like, just because something like is shoujo says shoujo beat on it, doesn't mean it's for teenagers. Um, what I was going to say, Jillian, in reaction to actually both of you is the, um, the opportunity this gives you to have conversations with your, your patrons and your students. It's my favorite thing to do when I talk about manga, because they, they love to tell me like all the, all that they know. And I'm like, I don't know, oh, I don't know that one. Tell me about it. And they will just go off. And so it's a really great opportunity to have like a conversation with them and be like, well, what do you think? Do you think that this is appropriate? And they're, oh, what do you mean? Oh, well, is there sex? Is there, and then they'd love, they love to talk about it. So I kind of play the, like, I'm really stupid card and like, oh, well, um, tell me about it. Huh? Okay. You know, and then they get excited because then they feel invested in the collection. They're like, oh, I like, I had a student who was like, oh, I told her to buy those. Like she got those. Cause I told her to, and I was like, like, yeah, yeah, I did because of you. Sure. Um, okay. But the, the opportunity they have to like voice their opinion and, and be a part of something is, is a great way to involve those students in your process and, and then further justify your, your collection purchases because you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe you're not liking it, but the students love it. Look how much it's checked out. You know, it's a, it's appropriate because they, you know, know what's appropriate for them. And then, you know, you can kind of, base your decisions off of that with that being said i completely mm -hmm. agree with matthew always check the the rating because they may think that they're you know ready for mature but you can't have that sitting on your shelf in like a high school library yeah there's there's some stuff that the students will recommend and i'll be like hmm okay lots of kids are recommending this let me go check it out at barnes and noble or something and i'll be like whoa hey okay but like i remember when i was a teenager teenage lives like sex drugs and rock and roll right but like i'm also curating a collection in the school and everything i buy has to have educational value so i can't really like get all the party manga kids you know like i have to get stuff that i'm able to defend and willing to defend because if my principals catch something or a teacher catches something i need to be able to stand up to it and be like i chose this because a b and c and if it's just too wild it's just maybe not the best choice. Yeah, I know when I inherited our manga collection here and I was flipping, you know, kind of looking at it and seeing stuff, um, I had one teen kind of approach me while I was doing it and point to this volume and was like, oh yeah, I read this and it gave me like total nightmares. And it, I think it was Uzumaki by Junji Ito. And I'm like, oh, I know why, because I had nightmares as yep. an adult reading this thing. And it's like, you know, right next to like the more fluffy, nice <laughs> manga. Um, but I'm sure like the person who bought it before saw it on an ad in book list or something and was like, that's a manga, I'll just buy it and put it here. Not really thinking critically about maybe where it should go. Um, and I think that happens a lot in public libraries um, because the person curating the collection just doesn't take the time or research. I know when I started purchasing it at my previous collection, that's when I really started reading manga in earnest. Um, not only things that the teens would recommend me, because as Emily said, they'd come up to me and be like, Miss Amy, you got to read Beastars. I'm like, what is Beastars? I don't know anything. <laughs> What's happening? Um, and just like picking it up and flipping through it or checking it out from my home library and actually sitting down and reading it. Um, just to do their research I think sometimes some people just don't care and I mean I see this in other collections too like romance for instance um which is another <laughs> passion of mine romance manga and romance uh prose it, some people just don't care and they don't curate their collection well and it it can show for sure 
Uh, I'll also add another resource. Uh, some, some publishers don't always have age ratings on their comics. And so looking to review sites, um, no flying, no tights will often put not just like the publisher age ratings on it, but they'll say like, they'll give their own age rating to it as well. Um, in addition, if they think it doesn't necessarily match up. So I know there's been some titles that have been published as like all ages and people are like, you know what, this is maybe a team title. Um, so just be aware of that as well. Yeah, I just I just want to add like kind of comics in general um, as an industry, and this includes manga. Um, we have a hard time with age ratings because with pros you can use Lexile scores. And I know there's an adapted Lexile um, scale for comics, but it doesn't really truly account for the interrelationship between words and pictures. And so age ratings, I think um, you know. One of the things that we believe is that age ratings should be it should be a publisher's decision to include them. Um, and you know, if a publisher decides to do that, they should be very conscientious about how they're doing their ratings. Uh, and I know that when um, I put together materials that have age ratings, I tend to defer to what the publisher says. And if the publisher doesn't say anything, I hesitate because this is where kind of those that values thing comes in. Is I tend to be pretty egalitarian about content i really think kids can handle stuff that at, at, a, at a much higher level than we realize i think they're much more sophisticated than we realize in a lot of cases and um but there are a lot of people who would disagree with me um and so uh we we also need to recognize that sometimes these age rating systems can be kind of subjective as opposed to objective and it's kind of hard to establish an objective system within comics because how do you assign numbers to something that involves pictures and, and words? Because um, it's not a matter of using sentence length or word length or how many, you know, how many syllables are in a word um, anymore. It's, 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 it's a much more complex issue. So a, a funny thing at an American Library Association conference a few years ago, uh, Gerard Way was there talking about the, um, the line of comics he was doing at DC, which were all rated mature readers. Um, like it was uh, like Doom Patrol and Mother Panic and other titles. And he's like, these are aimed at smart 16 year olds. That was his target audience <laughs> for them, even though they said mature readers and all of the, the books themselves. Um, so yeah, teenagers definitely will read this stuff and will want to read this stuff. Yeah, I, and I think it's also important to think of thinking about what the publisher thinks is appropriate and may not be necessarily what you know, patron, parent, whoever thinks is appropriate. And I, I, I'm very lucky in that, I, you know, I work in a high school that, you know, cares towards a college program, which gives me, I think, a lot of freedom. Um, but I'm thinking back to when I worked in comics retail. Um, and I remember, I just had this very clear memory of like, you know, selling comics to parents and like, I'd have a kid, like a, you know, six-year-old who would pull Deadpool off the shelf. Um, and I would, I would always go to the parent and I'd be like, look, I, you have to look at that. I'm not selling this to you until you look at it and tell me it's okay. And I remember very clearly one time a mom who like flipped through it to goes, oh yeah, I don't care about the, the violence stuff as long as there's no boobs. And I was just like that. Okay. That's your version. That wouldn't be my version. Um, but like everyone thinks of appropriateness differently, um, and just kind of thinking about what's a, what what does your community consider appropriate? How does that connect to the, the publisher ratings and reviews and all of those different things? Yeah, I, was I just want to say oh, one more thing. Sorry, I'll be really fast. Mm -hmm. um, the a resource that I think everybody needs to look at if you're even if you're well into it, but if you're just starting, especially look at publisher catalogs. They send them out. They have them on their website because this is something that everybody, when I talk to them, they're like, well, where do I start? I look at publisher catalogs. I mean, Viz has a huge catalog. Udon has a whole huge catalog and they have the, the ratings in there. So it's really easy to be like, okay, well, where do I start? Well, you start with one, you work your way. So <sighs> it's very, I know people can be very overwhelmed, but look at the publisher catalogs because all publishers are going to want to sell their books and they're going to provide you with the catalog. So start with the catalogs and then do some more research. And I was just going to say ratings don't always mean it's appropriate for, right? Because there's some stuff that's rated older teen that's totally fine stuff. You know, it's just, they, like Viz gives a description of why they give each book the rating, right? This is their brief snapshot of like why it got a certain rating, but that doesn't mean the rating doesn't connect to your community. It doesn't connect to what's appropriate for your particular community because 
I'm a sixth through 12th, 12th grade school in New York City. That could be a very different community than like a sixth through 12th grade school in Florida. So just keeping that in mind. But for the sake of time, we're gonna jump to our last question. The, the goal of our, our webinars is to provide some titles that we think are worth having. And the question is what titles or title do you think is worth defending, worth purchasing, worth giving in the hands of readers? All of them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I've been reading, uh, and I don't know how I got into this, but I started reading Moriarty the Patriot recently, and it's been something I've been recommending some of the older teens because there is quite a lot of murder and chaos in it, but it also tackles like complicated things like how do we dismantle the monarchy <laughs> and why uh, titled white men are bad, and I'm like, yeah you should do this. Um, this sounds great. But in turn, a lot of those teens who are like heavy into TikTok have been recommending me a lot of stuff that they see on there too. So it's, it's a cyclical thing. Like I'm telling them to dismantle the monarchy and they're telling me about escape the infinity. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it goes both ways. I'll go next. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> I, I think some of the the more old school manga are really popular, still really popular, and should be included. Um, some stuff like Tokyo Ghoul, uh, very violent, but it's hugely popular. I actually have three sets of Tokyo Ghoul because it's so popular, and it's nice too because it's a set. It doesn't go on and on and on. But I mean, there are other you know things that branch off, but it's nice. Um, but also a silent voice is really popular in my library. It's kind of on the sweeter side, more emotional. So not having, I like having, you know, a balance in what I purchase. I don't want all action, but, um, that's another popular one. Um, of course the really popular ones like My Hero Academia and Attack on Titan, those kind of things, um, Hunter x Hunter and, uh, Spy, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, Spy. X Family. Thank you. Family. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's another one. Of my one best picks. Yes, it's very popular. JoJo is really popular as well right now. I have to say, hearing you describe Tokyo Ghoul as an old school title has made me feel like I am a million years old. <laughs> um, Sorry. Two titles. It's fine. Two titles I'll mention um, that are maybe not ones you're going to hear a lot about necessarily. They're both just one shots, um, but I think that are worth having in libraries are uh, What the Font, a manga guide to Western typefaces, um, which is fairly recent. And it's a nonfiction comic about fonts, um, which I think is, is really neat. And I think it'll definitely appeal to, to, a certain, to certain students that are really into that sort of thing. Um, and another one that I think is, is a really interesting one to look at um, is Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths by Shigeru Mizuki, uh, which is a 90% autobiographical comic about his time in the Japanese army during World War II. Um, and that's just a really, like if you, especially if you have, you know, like history courses that are covering that time period, that's the sort of thing that I think could um, be a, just a, a good title to have to, to be able to recommend to folks to be able to have, like here is, a, a very different viewpoint than a lot of what you'll see in, in history books um, or from from North America. Talking about older older manga, uh, um, I find that no matter what year it is, I inevitably always have a student with a Dragon Ball Z t-shirt walk into the library. Um, some things are just always popular. Um, Dragon Ball Z, like my own Sailor Moon collections, like right here. Um, <laughs> But thinking about like other titles, a um, couple that have been really, I thought have been really cool in my library, uh, Witch Hat Atelier. I always never remember if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And um, Girl from the Other Side are both really cool uh, manga that like maybe like move away a bit from like shonen. And if you've got students who like, like manga, but like maybe, you know, tired of My Hero Academia and tired of that kind of thing could be a, a good, change of pace. Um, I'm also really, I really love the, the manga and the anime High Score Girl a lot, um, which if they're into video games is, 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 is a really sweet manga and it's like a kind of growing up together story and a romance story, but also it has to do with fighting games, um, which is just excellent. Uh, so my first recommendation is actually My Brother's Husband. 
um, by Gengoro Tagame, which uh, I find it kind of fascinating that he did this super kid-friendly um, series, but he is known best for gay erotica. Um, and, but, you know, it's a beautiful series. It's a beautiful story. Um, and uh, I adore that series. And, uh, and my other suggestions kind of skew a little bit older. I'm actually going to call out a book that Matthew mentioned, What is Obscenity by Roku and Shiko. This book is, first off, I thought it was hilarious because she's got a very wry observation about her experience getting arrested and going to jail for obscenity in Japan. Like this is, it's a true story. And it also does a really good job of illustrating how the protections we have in the United States as far as speech are concerned don't necessarily exist elsewhere, even in countries that we consider developed. Um, and, uh, and, and also how the perception of, of female and male genitalia is different in Japan. Um, and so I think, I think that's an amazing book. And I think it does a really good job of, of, of illustrating how censorship is an issue abroad. Um, and then uh, kind of my last plug is pretty much anything by Moto Hagio. Uh, you know, uh, The Heart of Thomas is like one of the original boys love comics. And um, I know it might seem kind of quaint by contemporary standards, but it, it's really foundational to, to what manga has become today. My Brother's How This Bend is also only two volumes long, so it won't, you know, break your budget or your shelf. <laughs> I recommend that to a lot of adult readers or like parents who want to understand manga. I'm like, why don't you try this and like see what this whole thing could be about? I, I was originally going to recommend Not Your Idol, but I know that that, because I was thinking of like, all right, what books can maybe, I, I don't know, a title that I actually would be willing to defend. Why is, why did I choose it? Not Your Idol. I know it deals with like violence and sexism and objectification of women and femininity, and it could be triggering for some people, but then it just led me into thinking about just all of the social emotional learning titles that manga have available for teens, and these are worth defending. So Emily had mentioned A Silent Voice. It's about suicide and bullying and disability, and that needs to be there. And this week I read The Golden Sheep. That's only three, uh, three books if you've read that. And that focuses on like, literally everything teens are dealing with. It's four teenagers that are going through, it's bullying and suicidal ideation and threats and fighting and running away and relationships and sex. And it's just everything that they need to see other teens experiencing because they, I feel like it would help some teens have words that they might not have to describe what they're going through, or they'll see that these are things that are happening that they can talk about. And while some of these titles cover a lot, I think a lot of mangaka do a good job of like helping the characters see their pain and their struggle and bring them through the challenge. So I would defend any social emotional title like that. And of course, LGBTQ titles like Bloom Into You and Blue Flag and Our Dreams at Dusk. And those need to be on the shelves too. Those are titles that we should be defending. Um, anybody else have any they wanna share before we close out? I was gonna say another one that's that's really popular and also shorter is Erased, hugely popular. Um, I it's just a beautiful book. Uh, the whole series is gorgeous. And then also Comey Can't Communicate, very popular in my library. And um, surprisingly, I have a lot of boys check it out. Um, just wouldn't think it was really like a boy title, but I, I don't know. It kind of mm -hmm. crosses uh, a lot for for my for my students. So that's another one that I definitely recommend. Well, any other titles, we can certainly add to that resource doc and during the conversation that we have with attendees. So, all right. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for participating and sharing their expertise tonight. Just a reminder, you can check out the manganlibraries.com website to see this webinar, the resources, and past webinars. Our next webinar in September is Manga and Libraries Supporting All Learners. We'll have some librarians, some teachers and some experts on that panel. Registration information will be released shortly. This recording will be posted on the GNCRT website. So have a wonderful night and see you soon. <laughs>